In case you've been wondering where I've been these past months, I had a new Crimson Capsule to swallow. And as is the nature with Crimson Capsules, you kind of have to adapt your worldview around them to reconcile the new information with your prior beliefs. Thus, I wanted to make sure my revised worldview is consistent by testing it in various discussions with others, both in person and online, before I release new videos containing incomplete claims, which I then might have had to backpedal on at a later point. As a psychologist, I never had any reason to believe in anything more than limited will to begin with. Ever since I started my studies, I of course became aware of all kinds of restrictions on human ability to choose and to act, from your intelligence to your personality factors, to limitations on our ability to do multitasking and so on. But of course you can pile a potentially indefinite amount of restrictions on top of each other without ever addressing the heart of the issue. Is there some remaining degree of autonomy, however small, that is quote-unquote free to decide within the confines of all the known restrictions, or does no such thing exist and free will is entirely an illusion? Well, I've listened to several arguments by people from other disciplines than my own, namely physicists and neuroscientists, but also philosophers, and overall I found their arguments in favor of determinism very convincing. So now I had to somehow align this with what I knew from my own discipline, psychology, and still the framework of complete and hard determinism had fewer, if any, contradictions than the alternative of limited will that somehow still tries to salvage a remaining degree of autonomy of the human mind. Now, note that I'm not here to disprove the notion of free will to you. That has already been done by other content creators who have done a much better job at it than I could. So instead of re-narrating my journey towards determinism, I'm just going to point you directly to the sources that convinced me, so that you can watch them and make up your own mind. This video right here, in contrast, is more concerned with the implications of determinism for the manosphere, for antinatalism, for the world at large. Thus, some of the things I'm going to discuss here might not sound all that convincing to you, or even outright contradictory, if you haven't been convinced of determinism itself yet. I do want to highlight one particular source on this list though, since that's the one I myself was initially the most skeptical about, but then also the one I ultimately found the most convincing. And that is the study by Soon and colleagues from 2008, which was brought to my attention via the video by Rationality Rules listed below though, so feel free to check out that one as well. The fact that this is a study published in a subjournal of Nature, you can't really aim any higher in terms of scientific journals than Science or Nature, i.e. a study that has gone through one of the most rigorous peer-reviewing systems imaginable and has well over 2000 citations, well, I guess there are some people out there who might still dismiss that as a mere appeal to authority, even though appeals to authority are much less fallacious when the authority in question is consulted on the topic on which they are actually experts. What is much harder to dismiss, though, is the temporal order of events in this study, how the data from the functional magnetic resonance imagery that was employed here allowed to predict which choice the participant would make seven seconds in advance of the participant becoming consciously aware of that choice. When I heard about this for the first time, as a psychologist I immediately thought of the low temporal resolution of fMRI and was therefore very skeptical of the timing accuracy reported here. What I didn't realize initially was that this seven seconds delay already included the slow response of the bolt signal, meaning you could predict whether the participant was going to choose left or right seven seconds prior to them becoming consciously aware of the choice in spite of the slowness of fMRI measurements. When you factor in this sluggishness of the bolt response, as the authors themselves call it, this actually implies that the neurophysiological response takes place even earlier, i.e. around 10 seconds before the choice enters conscious awareness. And this is the value that was reported in the abstract seen on screen here. Feel free to check out the entire study yourself, it's open access for anyone to read, and as is common with Nature publications, it has been kept as short and concise as possible. In other words, despite the obviously very simple type of choice required here, just an externally unconstrained choice between left and right, you basically have an example here where you can use fMRI to actually mind-read a person and predict within the confines of this experimental setup what they are going to do before they themselves know what they are going to do. You can of course still question the ecological validity of the study, meaning how much does this apply to real life and its much more complex long-term decisions. That for example is Jordan Peterson's position as far as I've understood him that you're more free with regards to your long-term decisions in terms of what are you aiming at, as he puts it. And then the closer that point in the future gets to the present, things collapse into determinism, much like with a car that will continue to cover a certain distance even when you hit the brakes. But if we entertain that idea of us supposedly having more control over our long-term goals than our short-term spontaneous choices, we have to ask ourselves, if the Soon and colleagues study shows how the smallest possible decisions work, just a supposedly free choice between left and right, what do our higher level decisions really consist of, except lots of smaller choices combined? If it can be shown that I don't have any control over the small single decision, then if a larger overarching decision just consists of several smaller ones interacting, how can I have any more control over the larger decision if I don't control the individual choices that overarching decision is comprised of? 
And that is just one piece of neuropsychological evidence. Once you combine these arguments for determinism with those made by physicists, you start getting the bigger picture. As I just said, I'm a psychologist, so I'm obviously stepping into layman territory now when trying to rephrase the physical arguments for determinism in my own words. But in a nutshell, as far as I've understood it, Albert Einstein still actually believed in something which has today become one of the most common misunderstandings, or sometimes deliberately created strawman of determinism, that being predeterminism. The idea that the universe is a giant clock started at the Big Bang, and that, given enough information, you could calculate everything and predict the entire future starting from that point in time. Human beings, being part of that same physical universe like every other animal, should therefore be subject to the same laws of physics and predictable in the same manner, again given enough information. A being capable of doing that would be effectively equivalent to Laplace's demon, an entity that knows the position and velocity of every particle in the universe and can therefore predict the future. Einstein famously summed up his convictions about predeterminism in the sentence God doesn't play dice. In opposition to that worldview was Werner Heisenberg with his uncertainty principle, stating that it is impossible to determine speed and velocity of a particle at the same time. Fortunately, Wikipedia has an allegory for this that is much easier to understand for me as a musician. And that's that it's also not possible to determine the duration and pitch of a tone at the same time. Because the pitch can change as time passes, you need to examine the pitch across a certain duration of time in order to determine it, thereby losing temporal precision. And in turn, a given pitch cannot exist in an arbitrarily short duration of time and still possess an exact frequency. The same principle holds true for a given particle's position and velocity. Thus, the world of quantum physics is random, and rather than making predeterministic predictions, you can only make probabilistic predictions. A common misconception is that quantum randomness opens up the door for free will again, but this overlooks the simple fact that you don't have any more conscious control over a given process if it's fundamentally random than if it's completely deterministic. And there are a couple of metaphors I've come up with in order to visualize this for myself. I'm not sure if all of them are accurate, that's why I'm just throwing them out there for discussion. First of all, even if a process should theoretically be determined entirely by classical physics, that doesn't imply that we are capable of predicting the outcome. The lottery, for example, is entirely determined by the relative position of the individual balls to each other, their respective velocities, gravity, centrifugal force, etc. There shouldn't be anything happening in the ruffle drum of a lottery that you couldn't explain in terms of classical physics, but good luck predicting the result. My second example is that of a random process at the base level followed by determinism at higher levels. And I see a similarity here to evolution in which the first step is random, random mutation, but then follows the process of natural selection, which is not random, because it follows certain criteria, but unconscious. My example here is from my own practice with psychological experiments. Oftentimes those feature a series of stimuli that you want to present to your participants in a random order. More often than not, researchers will put constraints on this randomness in order to control for certain sequences of stimuli, i.e. the order is no longer actually random, but pseudo-randomized. However, if you genuinely put no constraints on your randomization process, if you just write down a list of stimuli and then have your program shuffle that list, then you don't have any control over the process. It's truly random. Yet, once that random process is completed, you end up with a list of stimuli in a given order. And this order of stimuli will now be deterministic for the participant. They will have to go through the experiment perceiving the stimuli in this one order and no other one. The stimuli don't suddenly start swapping positions in the list again halfway through. The first part of the process was random, the rest is deterministic. Now imagine I put this randomization command that shuffles my list into a loop and have it repeat constantly. I would always end up with a new list of stimuli, I would never have any control over the order, and each list itself would follow its order in a deterministic manner. However, we wouldn't have any time to examine a given list, because a new one is created on the spot that overrides the old one. To put it into a more tangible scenario, Imagine you were on a roller coaster with its ups and downs, the wagon is on the rails and can't go anywhere else than where the rails lead it. But the path of the railway is being recalculated every nanosecond or so. There's no other way for me to put this than to say we're destined to experience randomness. One objection I've heard to this proposition is that just pitting Einstein against Heisenberg renders determinism unfalsifiable, and therefore unscientific since any scientific claim, according to Karl Popper, needs to be falsifiable. Either everything is predetermined, or everything is random, but then determined by the outcome of those random processes. Either way, there is no room for free will. This can lead some to start into such debates with foregone conclusions. You can easily just use the surface level observation that we are part of a universe of cause and effect to assert that the notion of free will, any type of autonomous conscious entity capable of making choices while unbound by the laws of physics, never made sense in the first place. So the question really is, who has the burden of proof here? The people who say there is no free will, or those who say there is? Atheists usually assert that the onus to prove the existence of a god is on those who claim there were one. 
As long as the theists fail to deliver on that front, the atheist is just fine with being unconvinced by the evidence presented so far. If an atheist actively goes out of their way to state that they know there is no God, then they'd have to prove a negative. But most atheists don't do that. They refer to themselves when in doubt as agnostic atheists, unconvinced of the existence of God until proven otherwise. And this connects to general principles of science, where your null hypothesis is always that of randomness. You assume any differences you find between two things you are examining are completely random, until the likelihood of finding the present data pattern under circumstances of actual randomness becomes so small, conventionally 5% or less, that you discard the assumption of randomness, i.e. reject your null hypothesis. Therefore, I do agree that it's hard to falsify the determinist claims per se. Again, much like with atheism, you could transfer the assumption of randomness, that is, the default assumption of the null hypothesis, to the free will debate too, that any human action is due to randomness, unless you have sufficient evidence to assume otherwise. This would shift the burden of proof on those asserting that there is free will, rather than those who say there isn't. Free will exists would now be the alternative hypothesis that needs to be proven. However, this would never allow us to say the null hypothesis that everything is random is true. Absence of evidence for free will is not evidence of absence of free will. Again, just like with the idea of a god. In order to find evidence of absence of free will, we need to be aware of what the baby in the bathwater actually is that we're trying to save with this whole debate. And that's the notion of personal responsibility for not only your actions, but the choices that precede those actions too. You can do anything as long as it's X is not a choice. I think it's fair to say that in order to control something with your own volition, you need to be conscious of it. This is a necessary criterion, not a sufficient criterion. You can be conscious of your own heartbeat by actively giving attention to it, yet you still don't have any conscious control of it. But if you want to have control over something, consciousness seems to me like it's an absolute necessity. Which would mean that if it's possible to predict a choice you are going to make before you yourself are consciously aware of the choice, you don't have conscious control over that choice, i.e. are not the one making the decision. And this is precisely what I took from the study by Soon and colleagues that I mentioned earlier. A short interim summary. First, the modern understanding of determinism no longer equals Einstein's notion of predeterminism. Our inability to predict the future perfectly does not refute determinism. Second, merely being aware of something, being able to perceive reality because of consciousness, does not automatically imply we have any control over our decisions. The purpose of consciousness itself might just be that of a camera, to perceive, but without any option of altering the course. Of course, this begs the question why we even evolved consciousness to begin with, if it doesn't grant us conscious control over our actions. But working off the premise that pleasure and suffering are our main driving forces in life, consciousness is required to perceive those stimuli in the first place. If your body takes damage while you're unconscious, like under narcosis during a surgery, you have no incentive to act to prevent your body from taking that damage. Likewise, animals are of course sentient and thus capable of perceiving pleasure and suffering too, yet hardly anyone assigns free will to animals. In that sense, you could regard the belief in free will as a form of human exceptionalism. Third, a common objection is that we supposedly all feel as if we had free will. Of course, if this is indeed just a feeling, but we have factual evidence pointing to the contrary, then we could simply dismiss this objection with a swift move of Shapiro's razor. But I'd question how often we experience this feeling of free will to begin with. Anyone who claims to feel like they have free will, I'd like to ask, have you ever caught yourself procrastinating? Or engaging in other types of avoidance behavior, like out of fear or disgust? In turn, have you never caught yourself failing to resist a temptation, like some unhealthy type of food, or even just reaching for your smartphone when your reason told you not to? And finally, when you catch yourself just falling for some plain old laziness, does that feel like a conscious decision to you? The main evolutionary purpose of laziness would of course most likely be resource conservation, because resources were scarce in the environment we evolved in. But when you catch yourself being lazy, do you rationalize this as, I deliberately chose not to do X right now, even though I should do X, because I decide to conserve my resources for later? Or does it feel more like, I know I should do X, but somehow I just can't get myself to do it? Even just subtracting these few things from your supposed autonomy, how free would you really want to call what potentially remains? I've certainly observed that when it comes to the free market or freedom of speech, that a lot of people, especially in the Anglosphere, are quick to revoke the label free for those as soon as just a couple of restrictions start being applied to them. In other words, if you just applied the number of known restrictions on libertarian free will to the free market or free speech, those same libertarians would probably no longer consider the label free accurate. Yet, a lot of talk in the manosphere, but also in the antinatalist community, does indeed circle around the notion of personal responsibility. Some champion it just as a sign of personal growth and maturity, the ability to take responsibility for your own actions. Jordan Peterson, meanwhile, goes even further and champions taking up responsibility as basically nothing less than the meaning of life in general. Find the heaviest load you can carry and carry it. 
And of course, all of this talk is being intermingled with moral debates. I've talked in my past video, Bridging the Divide, about how, despite the general agreement that evolution is a brutal and messed up game, people from the Crimson Capsule and Antinatalist community tend to derive vastly different moral implications from that same physical reality. A good practical demonstration of how you can't get an odd from an is, because it's never just a single odd that logically follows from the same is. Even just the general agreement about the statement that life is suffering can lead to many different odds. At base level, does that mean I should reduce suffering, or should I learn to accept it because it's inevitable? And then if I conclude that I ought to reduce suffering, who's suffering? My own, or that of others? Which should I give more consideration to? We all have our opinions on that, but the mere presence of other opinions on morals and people who still agree with us on the same description of reality demonstrates how reality itself doesn't imply any particular conclusion. That's because the universe as a whole, being largely inanimate and devoid of life, embodies nihilism and has no interest in guiding us into any particular direction. The only things that do guide us to action in any direction are our internal drives, and they do so by either rewarding us with pleasure or threatening us with suffering if we don't comply. And the joint pursuit of seeking out pleasure and avoiding suffering is generally summed up under the term well-being whenever you want to refer to both at once. When connecting this back to determinism, I think it's important to acknowledge that, even in a framework of limited will, we'd already have a problem of holding everyone to the same moral standard. Not so much because of the presence of limitations to human freedom themselves. In fact, as I said before, we could pile a potentially indefinite amount of restrictions on human freedom of choice and still judge people by how they choose to act within the margins of the degrees of freedom they have left. The fundamental problem with any notion of limited will is of course the homunculus problem, the idea of a somehow autonomous entity inside your brain that makes these decisions. If we imagine the human body as a car, with all kinds of technical equipment and restrictions and the ability to go places, then the homunculus would be the driver. The car would be restricted in many ways. Some things are obviously completely impossible for any car to do. For example, it can't just decide to take flight. Some things are possible but limited, like the maximum speed you can obtain and how long you can drive before needing to refill the tank. Also, the strength of your brakes. Those would be impulse control in this analogy. If the homunculus on the driver's seat now had libertarian free will, he could only work within the technical confines of the car but he could be held responsible for what he decides to do while driving this car. It doesn't matter how many restrictions the car has, we are aware of those, they are a given, but it does matter how you choose to work with those restrictions. But now we get the problem that society is a highway featuring a bunch of cars. If all of these cars were the same model, with the same abilities and restrictions, then we could hold all the homunculi in the driver's seats to the same standard. Because they're all working within the same restrictions, but some are doing a better job at it than others. In short, if everyone's consciousness were born into the same type of car, the same model, then and only then could we hold them to the same standard. At latest at that point, it should become clear to you, even if you believe just in limited will with some remaining degree of autonomy, i.e. with the homunculus on the driver's seat, that this still poses a major problem to our ideas of justice and morality, because evidently not everyone is born into the same type of car. Some people are born into cars with a high speed cap, others into more fragile cars that can't go nearly as fast. Some people are born into cars that only require little energy to keep going for a long time, others need to expend more energy to travel the same distance. Some people are born into electric cars and thus have an easier time living an eco-friendly lifestyle than people born into a diesel vehicle. And finally, some people are born into cars with broken or even without any brakes at all and thus will end up running other people over with a much higher likelihood than people inhabiting cars with intact brakes. In short, even in a framework that accepts limited will, we still couldn't hold people to the same objective moral standard. And whenever we try to set up cutoff values, drawing lines in the sand between people that are supposedly not in control of their actions and people who are, those lines seem very arbitrary. How weak do your brakes have to get before running over somebody is no longer your fault? How strong do they have to get before it becomes your fault? How empty does your tank have to get before you're no longer to blame for a lack of energy, i.e. laziness? How full does your tank have to be before I can start blaming you for your laziness? These arbitrary lines between people who are supposedly in control of, and therefore responsible for, their actions, and those who are not, is one of the many contradictions that I started seeing with notions of limited will. Contradictions that the more consistent view of determinism, where nobody has free will, simply doesn't have. We generally only seem to have an easy time distinguishing very drastic cases, like those of people with severe brain lesions, where entire areas are missing, from people with an entirely intact brain. Henry Mollison, commonly just abbreviated to HM, the most investigated neuropsychological patient, had severe anterograde and also retrograde amnesia as a result of brain surgery. Parts of his medial temporal lobe, including large sections of the hippocampus, were removed to treat his severe epilepsy. He could still learn new tasks at a procedural level, like drawing a star by using a mirror, get better at performing them, but he did not remember he had performed those tasks before. The researchers needed to explain the task to him again every time, 
And also, he obviously couldn't remember having met the researchers themselves. They needed to reintroduce themselves to him regularly. Another famous case is that of Phineas Gage, who got a metal rod through his head due to an explosion while working on a railroad track and took severe damage to frontal brain areas. Consequently, while his intelligence and motor skills weren't damaged, his personality changed drastically. He became a lot more impulsive and less reliable. This is crucial because, while we tend not to blame people for characteristics like their level of intelligence, we somehow do still attribute more control to people when it comes to their personality, like how agreeable or conscientious they are, even though we already know that, for example, the big five personality traits are at least in part heritable, just like intelligence, and also very stable across the human lifespan. If a person with anterograde amnesia because of neurological damage had forgotten your name when you met them again, would you be personally offended by that? If a person with reduced impulse control because of neurological damage were to molest you somehow, while you definitely wouldn't enjoy that any more than if somebody else did it, would you rationally blame them for their actions? No, because you know there's a clear scientific reason for it, and it's evidently not the person's fault. But if a patient's freedom to choose what to remember or not is so clearly impacted by the neurological setup of their brain, and we're all aware of that, how do we justify suddenly making the jump to assuming complete control over one's actions in case of a healthy and intact brain? The intact brain should determine the person's thoughts and feelings the same way as a damaged brain, just with different outcomes, of course. And it will obviously be much harder to pin down what part of an intact brain is causing somebody to behave a certain way, compared to someone who has entire brain regions missing. But that doesn't give us any reason to assume the person with an intact brain had any more control over the neurophysiological processes inside that brain itself. A few days ago I read a story about a guy named Jody Smith, who was also suffering from epilepsy, but also from regular panic attacks, so in his case, the right amygdala had to be removed. Now he basically no longer feels any fear. This should not come as a surprise to anyone who has at least some remote knowledge of what the amygdala is for. But what does this tell us about the supposed virtue of bravery, or about the supposed weakness of cowardice? Before this diagnosis, a lot of people, especially in the neo-masculine parts of society, would probably have considered a guy with regular panic attacks a coward or weak, and simultaneously somehow responsible for his condition. Now the guy is effectively fearless and only has his reason, prior experience, and of course pain reception to resort to in order to tell him what he ought not to do. And anyone who doesn't know about his brain surgery might admire him for the risks he's now all of a sudden willing to take. And now that we've started questioning virtues and vices, now that increasing knowledge about how the structure of our brains can influence our personality and character has allowed us to dismantle cultural values we hold by making us able to reduce them to just natural consequences of an underlying process, now I guess it's time to talk about the connections between and the implications of determinism for nihilism. Nihilism generally seems to have become a negative buzzword for both the manosphere and the antinatalist community. Crimson capsule folks tend to see nihilism as a threat that emerges in the vacancy that religion has left behind. Among others, this notion is perpetuated by people like John Peterson, who is basically just paraphrasing Nietzsche in this regard. Antinatalists, meanwhile, often feel the need to distance themselves from nihilists, because they tend to get lumped in together for their pessimistic outlook on the world. Yet, the antinatalist heavily objects to any claims insinuating that, quote-unquote, nothing matters, because they are very much convinced that, even if nothing else matters, well-being, and specifically the avoidance of suffering, certainly does. In short, it seems like nobody in our quarter of the internet, manosphere or antinatalist, wants to get called a nihilist. And I don't consider myself one either. However, at the same time it would be ludicrous to deny the connections both the manosphere and the antinatalist philosophy have to nihilism. There is something inherently nihilistic about the crimson pill, since at least the first step in taking it is to question everything you thought to be self-evident thus far. It's deconstructive, sometimes even destructive. It first and foremost shows you the flaws in your previous belief system without necessarily offering an immediate alternative. There are some people who try to do that, exploiting the new vacancy they've created in your mind to immediately fill in their own agenda. This rabbit hole seems to exist mainly in the US, where the colors of the pills can easily get tangled up with the colors of the two major political parties. Swapping the blue for the red one, for some just equals flipping from Democrat to Republican and trading one fixed set of beliefs for another one. The red actually turns into a rep pill and conservative voices in the community will do their best to make you swallow it whole. Are you critical of wokeness? Then you should be for limited government too and lose gun laws, and against abortion, and possibly rediscover religion. And at that point at latest, we're starting to move away from the scientific character of the crimson pill, i.e. the idea that you should always be ready and ideally even aim to falsify your own assumptions. But the trade-off associated with that is that science indeed usually restricts itself to is statements, not to ought statements. So unless you then go down the path of trying to construct an objective secular morality, usually based on well-being, i.e. pleasure and suffering, and maybe even believe that you can get an ought from an is after all, like Sam Harris does, then you can easily be left with nothing. And at that point, when you're truly left with nothing, it's easy to fall into resignation. 
The Crimson Capsule can accomplish this by destroying your blissful illusions about the supposed gold at the end of the rainbow, the idea of living happily ever after in a romantic relationship. The Black Pill for some people has the same effect at an even earlier stage, by merely trashing their hopes about their own chances on the mating market, critically though, without debunking the notion of gold at the end of the rainbow. Which is what keeps a lot of incels obsessing about the supposed benefits of relationships, rather than questioning whether there are actually that many benefits to the lifestyle they think they're craving to begin with. In some sense, the black-pilled person remains blue-pilled about the valence of romantic relationships, just like the Crimson Capsule guy often remains blue-pilled about the role of children in the game of evolution, still romanticizing the idea of having kids and merely citing external reasons not to have them, like divorce and alimony laws, rather than referring to inherent properties of sentience and biological life itself, like the ability to experience suffering. This is the remnant of meaning people from those two communities tend to hold onto. The black pillar still romanticizes relationships, the crimson pillar still romanticizes children. And both of them have external enemies they can blame for the fact that they can't obtain what they romanticize, most notably feminism. But once you get down to the level where you can see the forces of evolution at work behind all of these phenomena, then you found yourself a really unsatisfying scapegoat. The primary force to blame for all the suffering in the world, evolution, and in an even larger sense perhaps just the laws of physics in general, is not sentient, not in conscious control of its actions, and therefore not deserving of blame. Does that mean that nihilism logically follows? If we can't blame physics and nature, and if sentient beings just act as a consequence of those forces, how can we blame or give credit to anyone? Does that mean we should just stop judging and lose all of our guidelines for moral behavior in the process? Well, no. There's a small but crucial difference here. We might not be justified in judging and blaming people if they are indeed not in control of their actions, but those actions still have consequences. Consequences that are real. And making people aware of the simple fact that they'll have to live with the consequences of their own actions, whether they choose to perform them or not, is precisely what a lot of all this manosphere talk about rediscovering responsibility seems to be about at its heart. The notion of responsibility is the baby in the bathwater we want to save here, and we can, but much like with free will itself, if you want to retain the term, you might find yourself having to redefine it. Fortunately, in contrast to free will itself, for the term responsibility this doesn't seem to be necessary. You can just replace it with accountability. Einstein himself already realized that, even if a murderer is not responsible for his choice of committing a crime, he should still go to jail. A. Because he is a threat to others, and B. Because society needs to discourage similar behavior in others with that same criminal potential. And we are already doing this right now. If a person is confirmed to be incapable of guilt, because of, for example, some brain damage, they will still be locked away, just most likely in a psychiatric facility rather than some regular prison. We just still somehow make this arbitrary jump from acknowledging the absence of free will in a person with certain amounts of brain damage to suddenly assuming a person were in full control of their actions if their brain is intact. Why would we assume that? If the actions of a person with brain lesions are evidently determined by the structure of their brain, why should it suddenly be any different for a neurologically healthy person? The only difference that I would see arise, if we accept determinism in our criminal justice system, is an increased level of cognitive dissonance among the persecutors. On the one hand, they would still be justified to lock up a criminal, for the reasons stated above. On the other hand, they'd still have to contend with the fact that they're locking up an innocent person. And this takes us to my suspicion why human beings may have evolved the perception that we had free will in the first place. And this is a cynical hypothesis, but bear with me for a minute. What if the evolutionary gain of believing in personal responsibility resulting from freedom of choice is to reduce empathy with perpetrators in order to facilitate the punishment? After all, we've just established that the punishment is still necessary for the purpose of the survival of the group. If you let a murderer continue running around and ending people's vacation from non-existence, even if that person doesn't choose to do so, your tribe is still likely to go extinct because of that. If you entertain the thought that the criminal might not be responsible for their actions, i.e. that they're effectively still innocent, you might be more hesitant to do what needs to be done. And in a prehistoric tribal setting, that may well have meant executing the murderer. Keeping people imprisoned and continuing to provide for them along with the other members of the tribe, that is much less affordable in a natural environment of resource scarcity. If, however, you can tell yourself that the criminal chose to perform those acts of cruelty and that they are therefore deserving of the punishment they're getting, while simultaneously being able to tell yourself that you would never choose to do such a thing, then you can make the criminal part of an outgroup, thus lower your empathy towards that person, and you will have an easier time punishing them. Getting rid of a destabilizing force in a tribe, like a murderer, will benefit the survival of the tribe as a whole, and thus this behavior got passed on to future generations. All of this, however, does not prove free will is literally true only that it's metaphorically true. Believing in it, just like believing in certain deities over others, apparently benefited survival. 
In short, determinism would logically imply that human choice doesn't matter, because choices don't exist in this framework and something that doesn't exist can't have any impact on reality. But it would not imply that human actions don't matter. On the contrary, that is precisely what determinism asserts. Everything is cause and effect. The damage our actions do, the suffering we cause in ourselves and others, that is still real. We just don't have control over it, at least not in the way we used to think we have. However, if we can modify our environment, and that is something we evidently can do, we've been doing it throughout our history, then we can alter it in such a way that our environment in turn exerts its influence back on us, so that it nudges us in the direction we may want to go, but lack the willpower to go into all by ourselves. But we haven't quite overcome nihilism just yet. We can argue all day long that suffering matters to any individual sentient being that experiences it, and that because this is true across individuals, even though our thresholds for what we perceive as suffering might differ subjectively, the grand total of all experiences subjectively judged as negative is what we call suffering, and that therefore suffering objectively matters on a global scale. On a universal scale, however, what happens on this one rocky planet around this one small star in a tiny section of just one of countless galaxies, of course, even all the suffering in the world still has no impact in the grand scheme of things. The universe embodies nihilism, indifference to all life and sentience, and it does so precisely because it's largely uninhabited. The universe at large may not have any purpose or meaning, but that isn't a problem since there's nobody there to bemoan the absence of meaning. Only we here on Earth care about whether there's a meaning to life or not, because we need it as a way to explain our sentience and link to that to justify our suffering. This is where some nihilists have it backwards. They tend to obsess about meaning, or lack thereof, as if that's what throws people into an existential crisis. But it's of course perfectly possible to live a life without any greater meaning, just engaging in pointless hedonistic pursuits. That's how I used to see the world as a child, in fact. The purpose of life to me at that point was just to do what was fun to me and that was enough. The objective purpose of life may be procreation, since that's the criteria we select genes for, that's what our ancestors designed us to keep doing. But children already exist prior to that framework enacting its force on them. They don't know anything about procreation yet and thus it's not an integral part of their value hierarchy. At that point in time it's most important for them to set up and develop their mind for the future, and they do so through playing and exploring, without any determined end goal in mind. In short, absence of meaning is not a problem in the absence of suffering. The universe doesn't have a meaning, but it doesn't suffer either, so it's not a problem. And the hedonist doesn't require meaning either, as long as they don't suffer. If something they do gives them pleasure, that's enough reason to do it. The problem only arises when meaning falls away, but suffering continues. And unfortunately, that seems to be the default case. Because a hypothetical hedonist, who doesn't need meaning since they don't suffer, is something you rarely ever find in actual reality. Thus, in a pragmatic sense, the nihilist is of course right that the absence of meaning is a huge problem. But I'm not sure if your average nihilist has correctly identified the root cause of that. It's not the lack of meaning itself, it's suffering. And while I'm sure there are many nihilists who are aware of this relationship, that suffering is the thing that makes lack of meaning a problem in the first place, then it would still facilitate mutual understanding if they were more outspoken about that. Why would you keep drawing attention to the problem of an absence of meaning, rather than drawing attention to the root cause of suffering, if you are indeed aware that the latter is the root cause? As long as we can agree on the latter, nihilists and antinatalists aren't necessarily at odds with each other, I'd say. And yet, there are forms of suffering that effectively don't and perhaps shouldn't matter to us, because we have no way of preventing them. Even if we do our best to reduce suffering here on our own planet, chances are there is at least one other planet out there that harbors life. In fact, current estimations assume there might be up to 36 civilizations in the Milky Way alone. And those would just be those forms of life with higher intelligence. There might be further planets that only have animals, and yet, assuming evolution works the same way on other worlds as it does on Earth, those animals would still be suffering. That suffering will matter to those life forms the same way it does to life forms on Earth. However, in all likelihood, any other world that harbors life will be so far away from ours that we won't ever have any way of interacting with them. The huge distances between individual stars will most likely already make any message take longer than several human lifespans in order to reach the destination. And that's just one way. The way back for a possible response will take just as long once again. So giving an alien civilization tips on how we try to combat suffering, or in turn receiving tips from them on how to do it on Earth, is already wishful thinking. Going to another inhabited planet in person and trying to combat suffering there with our own actions, now that seems completely ludicrous in comparison. And the cynical reality that follows from this is that suffering on other planets doesn't matter to us either. It can't matter to us, we can't interact with it, and because it's therefore a useless thing for us to worry about, maybe it actually should matter to us indeed. Which would mean that, in some sense, we are just as nihilistic towards the majority of the rest of the universe as the universe is towards us. With that in mind, when somebody asserts that nihilism is the truth, as I have indeed seen people in the comments of both Manosphere and Antinatalist videos assert, then I can't really tell them they're wrong. In the grand scheme of things, on a universal scale, in a literal sense, yes. 
The universe embodies nihilism and I have no reason to assume otherwise, at least not unless we discover new evidence to the contrary. At the same time, this reality isn't all that useful in telling us how to conduct our daily lives, and oftentimes it might even be actively counterproductive for that. In other words, if religious and other mythological stories are literally false but metaphorically true, then nihilism seems to be the opposite. It's literally true but metaphorically false. The concept of metaphorical truth can be credited to Brett Weinstein. Peterson described mythological stories as true in pattern. Basically, this is just an elaborate way of saying there's a moral to every story, i.e. life advice you can extract from it, which Jordan Peterson frequently does, as we know, not all of his advice is based on psychological research or his own experience from clinical, i.e. therapeutic practice. However, metaphorical truth goes a little deeper than just the moral of an individual story, in that people like Jordan Peterson, Jonathan Pajot, etc. look for consistent, repeating moral themes across many different stories from many different cultures, rather than just analyzing individual stories in search of moral teachings. And writers do the same with regards to the structure of stories, again looking across many different stories to identify patterns that are effective at communicating an idea, and such that are not. Just like musicians have found out that the four chord song is an effective way to create mass appeal for your piece of art, writers will resort to guidelines like the hero's journey to structure their plot. And those structures have specific story beats that you need to hit, otherwise they won't be effective in conveying a sense of progress and therefore purpose to the story. Contrast this to real-life stories, to anecdotes, to the mundane things you could tell others about from your daily work and relationship life. Nobody plotted those events for you ahead of time. As we've established, we no longer have a reason to believe in predeterminism, and especially not divine predeterminism, as if heaven had a plan for you, to quote the Swedish house mafia here. Real life doesn't follow the script of a screenplay, it's non-stop improvisation theater. Closer to a video game, actually, than to a movie or a book. And I think this is one of the reasons why a lot of movie adaptations of video games suck. Video games seek to create immersion by simulating the freedom to act that you experience in real life too. And the more freedom to act you have in a video game, the less it can force you down the path of a particular pre-scripted story. Which coincidentally, going back to the roller coaster metaphor I used earlier, is called railroading. But when you try to extract a meaningful story out of such a context of freedom to act, it simply lacks the structure that a good story needs. How much fun is it to watch improvisation theater or somebody let's playing a video game for hours on end? You're basically just watching somebody else live their life without knowing whether there will ultimately be a point to it or not. Stories, meanwhile, written according to a certain structure, do give you that promise that there will be a point to it in the end. And in fact, they need to implicitly convey this promise, this feeling of there's a reason I should engage with this very early on in the story in order to keep the audience engaged. If you then later on trash the sense of meaning you established earlier in the story, you break that promise. You show that you lie to the audience by making them care about something about which you actually don't believe yourself that it matters. And usually the audience is not going to like that. It defeats the entire purpose of telling a story in the first place. If nihilism is the property of reality, and the reason you abandon reality and venture into fiction is to flee from that meaningless reality, but not just in order to seek refuge, but also in order to find some moral teaching there, which might then in turn benefit you once you return to reality again, then injecting nihilism into fiction merely makes that fiction just as mundane and unpredictable as reality itself. Now, when it comes to nihilism in fictional stories, when it comes to actively setting up a false sense of meaning with the deliberate intention of trashing it at a later point in the story, there are ways of doing this that have proven themselves effective. But this is definitely something in need of its own video. For the time being, the essential idea is just myths and other fictional stories are literally wrong by design. They're just figments of someone's imagination. But they do reflect the artist's lived experience from the real world, and the lessons learned from that experience can therefore of course also be useful to you when transferred to real life. Nihilism in a story, meanwhile, basically amounts to an admission that the artist himself doesn't have any clue of how to live in the real world, at least not to a sufficient extent that they would feel comfortable giving any life advice whatsoever, not explicitly, but implicitly through the themes their story conveys. You can do that in a humble way along the lines of I know that I know nothing, but that still doesn't say why people should listen to you if you have nothing to say. Then there is the interim stage of I can point to a problem, but I don't know the solution, like in Bertolt Brecht's epic theater. And then there is the most arrogant form, which is not only do I know that nothing matters, I'm also going to show you that your own previously established value structure doesn't matter either by actively seeking it out just to tear it down. That's what The Last Jedi did, and I'd say that's why people hated it. Nihilism in a story destroys both the refuge from the real world as well as the guidance of how to act in the real world, the two major benefits a story has over the real world itself. Making a story nihilistic, especially when it's realistic in its nihilism, means there's no hiding from your real-world suffering anymore. 
Real-life issues like politics bleed into the story, yet the story also doesn't offer any more guidelines on how to handle those real-life issues than the real world itself in all of its indifference offers you. A story that seeks to emulate reality by emulating reality's nihilism is therefore fundamentally useless. It tears down the old guidelines for how to act without constructing any new such guidelines of its own in order to compensate for that lack. Jordan Peterson once said on the Rubin Report that you can't be a non-believer in your action. Now he applied that to atheism and I think he was wrong about that. However, this is related to how he defines atheism. Peterson basically took the judge people's convictions by their actions approach and ran so far with it that anyone acting out values that also happen to be part of, but not exclusive to, any religious framework can be considered as acting out a religious ethic. Rationality Rules then pointed out how this would basically turn every vegan into a Hindu because the first records of the notion of animal rights stem from Hinduism. The more common example is the assertion that anyone who believes in equal rights between genders is therefore a feminist, when there are other philosophies with the same goal, like humanism or egalitarianism, that have good reasons for giving themselves a different label. So I do think Peterson is wrong in characterizing atheism this way, but if you take this concept that you can't act as if you believe in nothing and apply it to nihilism, then I think it holds up much better. In fact, the only people who can be atheists according to Peterson's definition, when you look at the way he describes their behavior, would essentially have to be moral nihilists. In school, many of us were confronted with the claim by Paul Watzlawick that you can't not communicate, and related to that you can't not behave or act in any certain way. You will always act in some way and this action will tell us something about the convictions you hold. This can also be linked to psychological concepts like the ideomotor principle, stating that we only initiate actions based on the intended, or at least anticipated effects resulting from those actions. I'd even go one step further and say, you can't act as if your own pleasure and suffering don't matter. One reason why we do seem to have a certain fascination with psychopathic characters, like the Joker, who is often considered to be a nihilistic character, is that they actually embody this complete indifference that only inanimate things seem to be able to embody in real life. If you have somebody who doesn't even value their own pleasure and suffering, who takes huge risks and even suffering on themselves just to prove a point, in a weird way that is a strength, a level of confidence resulting from an utter indifference to outcome, a level of confidence that many people would wish to have. And indeed I've recently listened to a video series called Ask a Psychopath, in which a woman with diagnosed psychopathy, a lawyer in fact, one vocation in which psychopaths are overrepresented, acknowledged that a lot of things in life might be easier for psychopaths, because they just don't care as much about the suffering they're causing, both to others and even themselves. In one of the videos she even mentions how she would have been completely fine with a person beating her up in a given situation. And again, harking back to determinism, we can ask ourselves, if that is their personality, psychopathy being one of the traits of the Dark Triad, alongside Machiavellianism and Narcissism, then can we really blame them for being the way they are? In short, yes, maybe some psychopaths can live as if suffering doesn't matter, not that of others and maybe not even their own. But even the psychopath can't live as if nothing matters. It might not be suffering, but it will be something else. Why did the psychopathic woman become a lawyer? Maybe achievement matters to her, reputation, money, whatever. I can certainly imagine it might be nice not to have the avoidance of suffering as your primary concern lurking in the background all the time. But you will still find something else that subjectively matters to you. And if it is just the endeavor of somehow proving to others that nothing objectively matters, which does seem to be a favorite pastime of some nihilists. So where does that leave us? Objectively, nothing matters in the grand scheme of things, but we can't live as if nothing matters. Not just for our own mental comfort, it's not like we just want to believe in an illusion of meaning to make us feel better. The experience of pleasure and suffering and the axiomatic odd that those things matter, all of that is indeed real. And this proximal reality merely doesn't map on the universe as a whole, because fortunately, most of the universe is devoid of life and therefore devoid of suffering. Suffering is a real problem, it's just extremely localized on a universal scale. As I said, to a mere 36 inhabited planets, according to current estimations. The inherent meaninglessness of the universe matters as little to us as our suffering matters to the universe. We are forced to deal with the trees, not with the forest at large. If nihilism is literally true but metaphorically false, that just shows us that there is a time and a place when even a value normally cherished as highly as truth can become useless in practice. And ironically there's something inherently nihilistic about that too. Even truth is just a tool you use to accomplish a goal, not a value in and of itself. At the same time, that doesn't give us license to throw out the literal truth just because it rarely fits our everyday purposes. We can't simply abandon literal truth in favor of a functional truth, one that either benefits survival for natalists, or in our case, one that benefits well-being. Because the truth, the reliable information we extract from reality surrounding us, is our canary in the coal mine. It's our warning shot, our best chance at knowing what's coming. Truth is the herald of reality. You can ignore the truth when it hits you, 
but you cannot ignore reality when it hits you. Instead, at that point, reality will ignore you. Because as we've established, physical reality is inherently nihilistic and therefore doesn't give a flying F about your personal well-being, the one thing you yourself are forced by your biology to care about. In conclusion, as we obtain more and more evidence for the limitations of humans to enact control, be that in terms of more psychological evidence that is at best in line with the notion of limited will and some undefined homunculus making autonomous decisions, or more evidence for straight-up hard determinism that can also come from physics and neuroscience, if we define ourselves as communities that pride themselves of their willingness to accept even uncomfortable truths, then evidence for determinism is not something we can afford to ignore. This will also inform the things we advocate for and, perhaps even more importantly, the ways in which we advocate for those things, how we suggest to obtain the goals we want to achieve. If any part of that how relies on human willpower, that will already be hard to pull off even in a universe with limited will, because this limitation is usually defined in terms of willpower resources, with concepts such as ego depletion working against human impulse control. If we now find that we're actually probably working in a universe of hard determinism, while it doesn't render us powerless to change the course of events, again, because we no longer have reason to assume that predeterminism or fatalism is true, it does imply that we probably need to outsource even more of the force that's supposed to affect the change to the environment by modifying it in such a way that it creates positive feedback loops for us. You know, just like putting your smartphone away once is more effective than having it close to you and constantly needing to resist the urge to reach for it. But that is most certainly a topic for another video. For now, I thank you all for listening. As always, feel free to disprove my claims in the comments down below and see you all next time.